Gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you, Lord, for another hour that you've given us to share together. Father, I just pray, Lord, that this message would glorify you. This is your ministry, Lord, and that it would uplift the hearts of the people that hear it, that the Spirit would move, Lord, and speak through me. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you for each and every opportunity we have to come together. May you pierce the hearts of those that once did this, that no longer are doing it, Lord, that you might bring them back to be with their brethren. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Mark or Matthew chapter 27. I just want to go through here and kind of take a look at what the crucifixion was and what the crucifixion done for us. There's quite a bit of reading in it. So I'm just going to take my time. I've got 40 minutes. I promise I'll have you out of here on time and look at some of these things. Everybody there say amen. I'm going to start at about verse 24. And it said, When Pilate saw that, the, they could, that he could prevail nothing, but rather than the tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood is on us and our children. Then they released Barabbas unto them. When he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And here's all these people. Jesus was innocent. Some of this stuff's going to sound really familiar tonight. They turned loose the one that was the murderer and they kept the one that was sinless to be crucified. We see a lot of, in today's society, we see a lot of people letting people out of jail and, and posting their bombs before they ever, they're hardly in jail at all so they're back out on the street doing the same thing. So basically what Pilate was doing, he was appeasing the people. He wasn't looking for the truth. He knew the truth, but instead of standing up for the truth, he just appeased the people. Then the soldier of the government took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put him on a scarlet robe on him. And when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and they took the reed, and they smote him on the head. And after that, they had mocked him, they took the robe off of the front of him and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to be crucified. Can you imagine the humiliation that went along with all of that, what they were doing to him? They didn't clap that crown of thorns upon his head. They hated him. They slammed that thing on his head. They wanted to humiliate him and put him in as much pain as possible. Amen? And they came out, they found a man named Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled him to bear his cross. And we'll stop right there. When we're going through life, and there's times, Jesus tells us to pick up our cross daily and to follow him. But there comes times in our life when we need help. Jesus went through this very scenario. Because that cross was so heavy. It was so heavy he couldn't carry it by himself. They'd already beat him half to death. They'd already humiliated him. And it was a load to bear, to say the least. So, in making this point, the point is, Jesus knows that throughout our life, our cross is going to get heavy. And He knows that we are going to fall, fail. But most of all, He knows we're going to need help. Amen? And as they came out, they found 
found a man, Cyrene, to help him bear his cross. And when they were coming to the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. So basically what they were doing, they were casting lots. It was kind of like in Vegas that Danny was talking about this morning. They was rolling the dice to see who was going to get what part of his clothing. How humiliating would that be? You know, to go through something like that, just on the mind alone, let alone the pain and the suffering that was in his body, that they're taking bids on his clothing. And sitting down, they watched him there, and they set up over his head accusations written, This is the king of the Jews. Then when there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and they passed by, they reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. What would provoke those people to do that. Let me tell you, Satan had never left the scene. He was still right there. He was provoking the crowd to, to humiliate Jesus and to torture him and to do as much harm for him as they could. That's exactly what was going on. The evil was still there. When you revile somebody, you talk to them in a very nasty way. And it, it, it's, it's a very angry and mad and just like in a rage. They, were, they hated Jesus. And say, Thou be the destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. Save thyself if thou be the Son of God. What's the first thing that Satan said to him when Jesus was in the desert being tempted? If you're the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. See, Jesus has never left the scene through the whole crucifixion. Jesus is walking around, and no doubt in his mind, he's thinking, I've got him now. I've got him now. Right where we want him. He's mine. Likewise, also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and the elders. You know, this mocking and this persecution goes all the way to the top. Have you ever been in a place in your life to where you felt like everybody was against you? You just didn't know where to turn. You didn't have a friend in the world. Can you imagine what Jesus was feeling like in him beaten half to death? Take yourself to that place. Take yourself in, just in your mind and in your heart what he was feeling at that time. All the way to the top, they're mocking him and making fun of him. And throughout this whole process, when he stood in front of Pontius Pilate, he never opened his mouth. Nothing bad did he say about anyone. 
one. And I think this is a lesson to be learned. When we're being persecuted and when we're being beat down by our fellow man, Jesus didn't say a word. And I think if we would be more like Jesus, the truth will always prevail. Amen? The truth will always prevail. Because who is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the light, and the truth. And if he's for you, no one can be against you. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. See? Jesus could have come down from that cross. He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have come down from that cross. He could have appeased those people right there at that moment in time. But he didn't do that. Why did he not do that? He didn't do that because of you and you and you and you and me and all the people throughout time. He came to save the world. <coughs> he put himself in a place that took every sin that we would ever commit. He took it upon himself because he loves us. He loves us so much he wouldn't do it. He stayed on that cross and he suffered everything that they poured on him. Listen to this. He trusted in God. He knew that God's will was for him to go to that cross and to die a horrible death for the sins of man. That was the only thing that would please God. Was for God to take on the form of flesh. And to come and die on an old rugged cross. To forgive man of their sins. He shed his own blood out on the ground. They scourged him. They treated him terrible. They whipped him with a cat of nine tails. It wasn't made to leave wells like Bobby Switch. It was made to rip off flesh. And that's exactly what it did. Let him deliver him now. If I will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice. I can't say that, but I can say this. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Have you ever felt forsaken? Have you ever felt forgot about? Have you ever felt that nobody cares? See, Jesus felt that way too. But He knew He was in the will of the Father. So no matter what comes at us, if we're in the will of the Father, we got to stay there. We got to stay in the will of the Father. That's what this life is about. And Jesus knew that. Then some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calls for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge 
and fill it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let it be. Let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Now I want to go to, I want to go, you guys don't have to turn there. I want to turn to John chapter 19, verses 29 and 30. Behold my mother, behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. Can you imagine being on that cross? And I've had this happen to me right here. Have you ever had your mouth and lips so dry that you couldn't even hardly talk? This is why Jesus done what he done. Now there was a set vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it up on Hesop and put it to his mouth. The reason they done that was in the, the first Passover. They were commanded to take Hesop. They were commanded to dip it into the basin where the blood of the lamb had been slain and to put it on the lintel of the door and on the side post. That's what they were commanded to do. And Jesus being the last lamb that would be slain. His mouth was so dry, and he had to say these words, but his mouth was so dry he couldn't talk. But he needed to say these words, and he did it. And it said, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished. He has fulfilled the will of his Father. He has gone across and he has died for the sins of mankind. That any and all who would accept him and come to him could have forgiveness of sin and have everlasting life. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. See, this is the same Jesus. This is the same Jesus that said, Why do you worry? Why do you worry about what you're going to eat or drink? Why are you anxious? Why are you anxious? But with prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. This is the same Jesus that conquered death, hell, and the grave while He was in the tomb. He knew, he, he knew that we needed help because He needed help carrying the cross. He knew that we would need help throughout our lives. It's the same Jesus that said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's the same Jesus. The very same one. So why do we worry? Why do we get anxious when He made us so many promises that we don't have to do that? And this is the same Jesus before he was getting ready to descend, descend to the heavens. This is what he said. Turn with me to John chapter 14. Everybody there? 
This is the same Jesus that said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Think about that. The same Jesus that went through all the punishment of the cross. He's the same Jesus that said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's the same Jesus that said he would go and prepare a place. Don't let your heart be troubled. Why do we let our hearts be troubled? Why do we get anxious? We don't have to do that. He said, fear not, because fear has told you. We don't have to be afraid. Jesus is never going to leave us. He's never going to forsake us. We have that blessed assurance that all through this life, the devil may kick us around a little bit, but we know who defeated him. We know who won the victory. Then here comes Thomas. We all know about doubting Thomas. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then he goes on to tell Thomas, he says, If you have known me, should you have not known my Father also? Every one of us in here that knows Jesus Christ as our Savior, we know the Father. We have every promise. We have the covenant. We have it all. But yet we let life beat us down sometimes. And I'm guilty of this. And I'll tell you what brought this lesson on. Anxiety is real. I have anxiety. One night I was sitting there and I was getting anxious and the room was as big as this room and within about three or four or five minutes the room felt like it was about the size of this pool. Here I go digging to get my little pig. I said, why are you anxious? You don't have to do that. And the way this come about, because he loves us. He don't want us to live like that. So what I do, I said, the Lord. So I picked up the real anti-anxiety. And I started finding the promises that the Lord Jesus Christ himself had made for us. And within 15 minutes of being in this, that anxiety was gone. Everything was back to normal. And I try harder and harder every day not to take things. This is all we need to take. It can heal you. It can save you. It can help you. It can comfort you. It can do anything. So with that being said, I want to go to, you guys are going to have to turn there. I want to go to, I don't know how it came to be. I read on the scripture. Hebrews. 
Hebrews chapter. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, says this. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. See, he ever liveth to make intercessions for them. He lives to take care of you and me. He's sitting at the right hand of Father God. He told us where he was going. He told us where he was at. He told us how to communicate with us. He told us he would send us a comforter. And he did. Every promise. Can you think of one promise he's broke? Can you think of one thing, one promise that he's broke? So why do you let your heart be true? Why do I let my heart be true? Because that right there is the word of God. It is God himself. And it says that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ that suffered that cross. Not only did he suffer the cross, but he made his promise, promise after promise.